Hello and welcome back to OmniFoot TV. This is your host Omar and uh, today we've got a lot to cover. I had initially planned to uh, post the uh, Superga air disaster video today by the afternoon, but based on all the news that's coming to light, I think I'm going to postpone it until tonight. I'm basically going to shoot it after this one. On to our first issue of discussion, and uh, I think everyone saw Eden Hazard's uh, picture uh, from after the game last night as he celebrated with uh, certain Chelsea players he was friends with, still remains friends with, and I, I started watching certain journalists' reactions. Uh, I was on Twitter earlier this morning. And he was trending in both Arabic and English, as I live in Egypt. So, Madrid fans are obviously not happy. And they shouldn't be. All I can say primarily on the situation is that Hazard should have known better. He is a smart man. He's not an idiot by any means. But... He should have at least waited until they went down the tunnel. Maybe uh, he could have gone to celebrate, or not celebrate, quote-unquote, but more so congratulate his former teammates on making making it to the UCL final. But he did it on the pitch. <laughs> I think it was quite the stupid decision. He made it quite obvious that well, I'm not sure he didn't care, but that's what it seemed like. I mean, if, if you paid attention to any of the stats from last night's game, Hazard covered more ground than any other Madrid player, and you can go back to check on that. But uh, as a fan, I mean, I spent a very long time watching Hazard play for Chelsea. I remember the, the hype that was around his transfer. How uh, he had apparently gone to uh, to White Hart Lane to watch a game at Tottenham. How he apparently flirted with moving to Newcastle. Mm. Can't really confirm that one, but I remember that being an issue at that point in time. I remember how Chelsea fans were just wondering how we, how we were going to get on without him. And it was worrisome. The idea that Hazard would not be there to sort of carry the team on his shoulder. Shoulder as well. Shoulder. He did practically carry us on one shoulder. It was it was quite the uh, worrisome idea. But, I mean, lo and behold. It was quite sad, though, to see him become a shadow of his former self, so to speak. And... If it were up to me, based on everything I've read and everything I've seen, I would say that Hazard is definitely going to leave Madrid at the end of this season. I don't think the fans are going to keep taking this. I mean, I think this was the last straw for them. He's been at the club for nearly two seasons now. Uh, Chelsea have effectively used the money they earned from his transfer to um, buy the players that they needed to manage to beat Madrid on their way to the UCL final. Which is kind of ironic. So I guess all I can say from this point on is that all we can do is wait and see. Moving on to moving on to the second issue at hand. It has been announced that the Coppa Italia will effectively remove teams from either Serie C or Serie D from participating in the tournament. And I call bull. I don't want uh, this video to quite possibly be demonetized when I apply for monetization, so I'll just call bull and leave the other half of the word to everyone else watching. Apparently, uh, they're doing this for financial reasons because they want to attract broadcasters who can spend more money. They want to make the competition much more attractive to viewers because... I'm fairly certain that European viewers are not, uh, not just European viewers, I'd say European, African, South American, what have you, aren't necessarily as familiar with the Coppa Italia as they are with, let's say, the FA Cup. I mean, the FA Cup is 
the oldest footballing tournament and it's marketed differently in a, in a position like <coughs> excuse me it's marketed differently in comparison to either the Coppa del Rey or the Coppa Italia and I think that's played a huge role in the way these businessmen have decided to approach things even the EFL Cup, even the League Cup in England as well. The English game is generally marketed differently in comparison to all of the uh, other tournaments in Europe, other other leagues and other cup competitions and such. And I would say that in order to familiarize more people with the tournament, they've decided to cut off the lower leagues, the third and fourth division in Italy. Although I think that could backfire. Because, again, football is all about competition. If competition is scarce, if competition is not as vital a part of the sport, then it loses its meaning. And as the decades have rolled on and on, and football has become much more industrialized, I would, I like to use that word in regards to how football has changed. It has generally become an industry, a business. The more of that has infiltrated the game the worse it's become overall. I mean, the pandemic has done enough, and it seems as though heads of uh, big competitions and club presidents and so on for clubs who are actually bringing in the money to their countries or continents, these people are all thinking in terms of finances. They're thinking in terms of what can I do to make the club more money, to make more money for myself in the midst of what's happening. Because for the most part, these clubs are in debt. Barcelona and Real Madrid are in debt. They're in a hilarious amount of debt. <laughs> they 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 have a lot of money to pay back. Madrid owe a billion pounds. Or euros. I can't necessarily remember the uh, the currency at the moment, but it was ranging around. Barcelona were were a billion in pa- pounds in debt, and Madrid were close to seven hundred or eight hundred million. And well, I think this is going to backfire, mainly because the more memorable a competition of this sort becomes. It gets to that point because of the teams that you wouldn't expect to make it. I mean, two runs to a certain EFL Cup final, uh, I will remember fondly, are both Swansea's and Brentford's, where both teams met in that year's Cup final. I can't necessarily remember the year, to be genuinely honest with you all. But it was interesting because Brentford, a League One side, at that point, knocked out both Man United and Arsenal on their way to the final. And that is... uh, League One is the third tier of English football. If you were to somehow remove the third and fourth tiers of English football from either the League Cup or the FA Cup competitions, it would just become bland. And I say that because I've seen certain moments that have just stayed with me for a very long time from teams like those. Um, I remember when Leeds were in League One back in uh, 2009, 2010, that season, when Chelsea won Premier League under Ancelotti. United uh, were quite the formidable side. And under they were still being managed by Sir Alec at that time. Leeds had reached... A certain stage of the FA Cup and they faced them, our rivals. And I remember uh, Jermaine Beckford scoring the winning goal of that tie. It ended in a 1-0 win for Leeds. And they effectively knocked United out of the FA Cup. That was one of the most intense games I I can remember uh, from the time I was a child. I think that was my first proper introduction to uh, to the FA Cup's magic although there were numerous moments that had happened in years years prior that I had seen 
as a kid. I mean, I've been supporting Chelsea since I was uh, uh, since uh, 2003 or 2004, something of that nature. <coughs> but I didn't necessarily have access to be able to watch a lot of games. And FA Cup games were generally difficult to uh, to find a way to watch. I would usually pay attention to uh, either Eurosports commentary on their website. You know, written down descriptions of what would be going on throughout the games. I didn't even watch the uh, FA Cup Final 2012. I I was lit- I was following the uh, commentary online because I did also didn't have access at the time. But that. FA Cup a game between Leeds and United that was something special and I think those kinds of games are better for football than the games you would expect to see between two supposed uh, modern day giants because let's be clear Leeds are a big side and I don't mean to digress by going into this topic this is more so an example that I'm lending to the whole Coppa Italia issue you would expect to see teams like... I, I remember Parma were uh, relegated recently. The, recently being a couple of years ago, they're back obviously in Serie A now, but they're still struggling. You would expect to see teams from Serie C and Serie D, more, probably, more prominently or more probably Serie C, making an effort to just state their claim and make sure that this competition is for everyone. You know? You would expect to remember the team's names and so on and so forth, and I think that's. Uh, I think it has to do with the marketing more so with the com- more so than it does with the competition in and of itself. Because let's be clear, culturally, football differs throughout every major country in Europe, and let's just say that England aren't necessarily on the forefront of football culture, despite the fact that. You know, it's coming home and all that. They don't necessarily have a school of thought in regards to football in comparison to Italy, for instance. And don't ne- I don't want anyone to necessarily quote me on that, but I would say that if they did, at the very least, they wouldn't have wasted so much time hiring foreign managers to coach their golden generation. You look at Germany, and you look at how they have a school of thought in football, and they prioritize the management of their local managers. They they prioritize giving local German blood a chance, which is what's happening with uh, Julian Nagelsmann, who is going to take over Bayern Munich. If you look at Italy, if you look at Italy, you'll see the same thing. And overall, this whole Coppa Italia issue reminded me of the Super League. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the issue of the Super League is not necessarily over. I think it's fair to say that the issue of finance taking over football is just beginning. I think this pandemic has done more damage than we have... uh, Then we have been informed. I think we are going to see changes that have been unlike anything we could have ever possibly seen. And you can go on to say that, for instance, the transfer market's prices will continue to grow based on Neymar's move to PSG. But I think it's going to be a lot more than that. Not the price in and of itself, but the movement and the context. I think players are going to continue to cost more, despite the pandemic. And I think because of this, the businessmen behind the sport are going to find out what ways can we make money in spite of everything. And that's what they're going to focus on. And moving on to our third topic. Apparently, the um, the Super League, the teams who are currently quote-unquote still a part of the Super League because they had signed a legal and binding contract, they are all going to be handed sanctions by UEFA, which is not surprising at the very least. I read this and thought, 
I'm not entirely sure if they're going to be banned from European competition or if these sanctions are going to be financial, but I would assume that they would be financial because that is the main focus of everyone involved nowadays. Kind of makes me sick. The whole financial aspect of it, not that they're being repercussed. I think they should all be repercussed. Every single team to have taken part of the uh, supposed Super League project must be punished. And I'm perfectly fine with whatever punishment they choose as long as it's fair. Because let's be fair here. UEFA aren't necessarily darlings. Their new Champions League format is effectively going to add a hundred games to every European competition throughout the season. And that is no joke. That is a fact. And with the um, latest and newest edition, the third tier European co club competition, the UEFA, Europa, uh, the UEFA European Conference League, you effectively gathered that there are going to be 100 games in the Champions League, 100 games in the Europa League, and 100 games in the UEFA Europa Conference League. That means 300 games in Europe alone, apart from domestic club competitions like leagues and cups. And fans sit around laughing at managers for whining about scheduling. Whining. People spent a lot of time making fun of Jurgen Klopp for complaining about the scheduling. And players openly went out to say that they couldn't stand it anymore. It's quite unreal, to be fair. It's just, how do you expect these players to keep up with such a demand just because you want to make more money? It makes little to no sense, from a football fan's perspective, obviously. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, Chelsea went on to announce earlier, um, actually late two nights ago, like not the night before, the night before last, late that night, that there would be fan presence in board meetings. That apparently fans would elect a delegation of sorts and that these fans would represent the overall fan base and be present during board meetings and have a say in club decision making. I think that's a good move forward. But I still wonder, how is that going to come into play with this whole Super League debacle? It's obvious that the pandemic is just going to keep going. People are still struggling with the virus. There are no fans. And watching watching the games without fans has become quite bland in a sense. I mean, we just had two huge UEFA Champions League semifinals play themselves out in the last two nights. And watching them without fans, as happy as I was last night, I, I tend to imagine what the game would have, like, would have been like with fans. Excuse me. And I remember a saying I heard throughout the um, first year of this pandemic. <laughs> first year. I make it sound like it's been half a decade. It's not great if nobody's there to see it. And despite the fact that these moments have been great for either club on paper, Manchester City reaching their first ever UEFA Champions League final, Chelsea reaching their third, their first in nine years, you would have expected there to be this unbelievable amount of hype. But since no one was there, it just makes you... It makes you sad as a fan. Be it, uh, be it that you may or may not support either club, it doesn't really matter. Lifting a trophy in an empty stadium. The idea of that. I mean, when I watched that happen last season, when Bayern won the Champions League and lifted it in an empty stadium, it was just sad. As happy as the players were. You start to understand what it means when the presence of others who love what you do give it much more meaning. And football without the spectacle isn't football. The spectacle has now been lost due to the pandemic. And I think because of that, the business side of things will be pushed to the forefront more than ever. 
and we can't necessarily say that we can't necessarily say that fans have overturned things with the whole Super League situation because it's not over yet. I don't think we can kid ourselves into believing that it is over yet. With the Coppa Italia announcement, uh, the changes to the Champions League format, and other obvious changes happening in Europe, and apparently uh, Africa, they're putting the idea of an African Super League on the table. It would be less than ideal to suggest that things will improve in the fans' favor if they don't get it together. Meaning that if they, if they don't take it or take their power to support their clubs to the clubs themselves. I mean, what Chelsea are doing by allowing fans to be present and board, to allow fan presence in board meetings and so on, I think that's, I think that needs to be done on all fronts. And I don't know if uh, you, the viewer, has been paying attention to a certain report that has been going around last week. Apparently, the British government is trying to intervene and find a way to improve the nature of football in the country because of independent ownerships and they have been well journalists have been talking about the 50 plus 1 rule being implemented in the Premier League if you're not familiar with what the 50 plus 1 rule is basically uh, 50% of the club is basically for the fans 50% of the uh, the club's ownership goes directly to the fans. The remaining 50% to the owners and the businessmen and so on. And here's the kicker. No decisions can be made without the approval of the fan base. Meaning that effectively the clubs own the uh, the fans own their clubs, sorry. And that rule is currently being implemented in the Bundesliga and has been since 1994. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, obviously. I think that if this rule were to be implemented in or across every major league in Europe, I was about to say in England, but if this rule were to be implemented across every major league in Europe, football would be... Football would be in another place. The sport would be in another place. I'd feel much more assured as a fan. I'd be much more in love with the sport as a fan. I wouldn't let the interference of the overwhelming financial juggernaut that has become the business of football make it difficult for me to support my club. And, well, I guess all we can do is try to realize that as fans, as we have seen, we have a certain amount of power. And we should harness it. Because it isn't just the club officials or the owners or the FAs or the uh, continental governing bodies who have placed the sport in this situation. It is also the fans. I want to make that completely clear. We have played a role in where football is now. And if we don't do our part, it's only going to get worse. I will um, end this video with the last topic at hand. Apparently, Villa have gone to the FA. Aston Villa have gone to the FA and to UEFA and have requested that if the Champions League final cannot be held in Ataturk Stadium in Istanbul, that it be held at Villa Park. <laughs> not something I expected to report not something I saw coming to the very least it would obviously mean that both teams would not have to travel and if you are not familiar with the fact that Villa have won the Champions League before then you are now 
I don't necessarily know how I feel about this decision, if it were to be made. But I say that either way, wherever the game is played, we'll know if it's worth watching within the first 10 to 20 minutes. I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with the final being played in England. It has been played at Wembley before. But as a Chelsea fan, to say that I've been waiting to say we are going to Istanbul since 2005, Luis, uh, Luis Garcia's ghost goal being the detriment to one of the greatest seasons the club has ever seen, to say that I've been waiting this long is quite the understatement. That's my bias. But objectively speaking, if it is going to be safer for the clubs, for the staff, the managers, and for the people involved all together, then I say wherever they choose to hold it, as long as it's not Baku, because that was a shambles. Wherever they choose to hold it, if they do choose Villa Park, for safety reasons, I'm all for it. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this has been my second video of this sort of podcast-ish news series. I'm trying to make this more of a communication-based video series. Even if I have messed up a couple of times, I just find that this is much more natural. It's much more authentic. It allows me to really communicate with the viewers. And mind you, this red folder is just as it was left here last night. I didn't move it. I've studied everything in it. The Superga Air Disaster video will be live tonight. Or not live. Uh, it'll be posted tonight. It'll be published tonight. And if you're interested in football history, or if you're a fan of Torino, if you're a fan of football altogether, you will genuinely be curious as to what happened within and around this air disaster. This has been Omar Al-Hamshari. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in once again. Please follow us on our social media accounts. The links are in the description below. And I will see you next time the whistle blows.